This is what this series over these next five weeks is going to impact, that the ultimate end of the gospel, the greatest good of the gospel is that we get to enjoy God ultimately forever. And I don't think uh, maybe that I'm the only one that maybe forgets this part of the gospel, uh, one of the most fundamental parts of it. Because, you know, as I've been thinking, as a Western church, uh, in a kind of Western culture, we're, we're always told, isn't it, it's all about us. And that's how marketing companies operate. That's how advertisers entice us with their products. It's all about us. And therefore, often, there's a danger, isn't there, that our gospel becomes all about us too. And I end up being the one that's made much of. See how God loves me. See everything he's done for me. And if the gospel ends there, if that's where it ends, who ends up being glorified? Me. Now, please don't think that what I'm saying is, you know, God loving us and all the things that God has done for us isn't something to contemplate and to, to marvel in. We should cherish that truth and, and, and praise God for it. But if that's where the gospel ends, with us looking inwards and not upwards, we're left with a very self-centered gospel. And we don't see where the gospel is meant to lead us, where the end of the gospel is meant to take our eyes. And I want to show that, hopefully, as we start this evening with a really helpful illustration that I got from uh, John Piper. And although I'm not married, uh, I believe that, A, uh, for those of you who are married, that this is probably the case in marriage, and B, that people who aren't married for us this evening can probably imagine uh, and understand this illustration taking place. So I want us to imagine that, you know, a husband wakes up one morning and he wakes up, he gets out of bed and he walks to the bathroom. And as he's walking to the bathroom along the landing, he trips over something that his wife had left uh, on the floor. And at that moment, he stubs his toe. He's in a, he has a real shot of pain go through his toe. And in that moment, husband walks back into the bedroom, speaks with his wife and reacts in a way that is way out of proportion to the event that has just taken place. And afterwards, after they have this discussion, after the husband goes into his wife, the husband knows afterwards that what he's done is way out of line. He knows he's messed up in the way that he's spoken to his wife. And after a few moments, he walks down the stairs to where his wife is, feeling incredibly guilty uh, for what he's done. And as he walks downstairs, he sees his wife there and is, there's a, a real palpable tension. It's, it's like ice in the air. And there's a very visible tension. The wife's got her back turned towards him. And the husband knows in that moment that he needs to ask his wife for forgiveness. Now, at that point, we need to ask the question, why does the husband want his wife's forgiveness? Is it so that all of his guilty feelings will go away? Is it so that she'll maybe make him his favorite breakfast again? Is it so the kids won't uh, see them fighting? Is it so that in actual fact, uh, she'll confess that it was her fault in leaving uh, the trip hazard on the floor? Now, all of those things might be true and why the husband wants to ask for forgiveness. But at the core, at the center of the reason that the husband wants forgiveness from his wife is so that the relationship can be restored so that they can enjoy each other's presence again. She is the reason the husband wants to be forgiven. And you know, that is the reason behind this five week series we've got coming up in our evening services. The gospel is ultimately good because we get God. 1 Peter 3 verse 18 says, for Christ also suffered once for sins the righteous for the unrighteous. And then it says, to bring you to God. That's what Christ did, to bring you to God. That's why he suffered and died, to bring you to God, to restore that broken relationship. And not just that we get to be with God, but I hope over these five weeks, we're going to see that this is the highest, the deepest, the longest joy that we could ever have. 
To put it in another way, God is the greatest gift that God could give to us. Do you know, Blaise Pascal, who's a famous mathematician and scientist, he said this, he said, there is a God-shaped vacuum or hole in the heart of each man which cannot be satisfied by any created thing but only by God the creator made known through Jesus Christ and you know when we're convinced and sold on that truth what happens is is that our gospel is transformed from one that ends with making much of us to one that makes much of God and sees him so glorified as so worthy in every way. To use the phrase of, of, of one of John Piper's books, he says, God is the gospel. God is the gospel. And yet, as I want to see, us to see in this introduction tonight, that this theme that we're going to be exploring of the presence of God isn't just important for just some of the reasons we've already explored tonight, but this is in effect the most important theme laid out throughout the whole Bible narrative. Because although our Bibles, they're made up of 66 individual books that in one sense differ from the history they're recounting, the people's stories they're telling, there is a narrative that runs through each of these 66 books. Namely, how it is that God can be with his people for good. And that's what we're going to do for the remainder of our time this evening. We're going to have one big Bible overview. And we're going to go through it very quickly. And I think it's great that at times we, we explore and we see how the Bible tells this one big story uh, through all of these different little stories. And the emphasis and the importance it places on the presence of God and why it matters to us uh, so much. And so if you've got a Bible, um, we're going to go through it very quick, but you might want to have it in, uh, right in front of you uh, as we go through. And just to say, on the website, on the online services, there's a PDF uh, document uh, that outlines all of these things. Uh, so you might, if you, you can go and look at it now or afterwards if you wondered what on earth I was saying. Uh, hopefully you can go and check that out. And that will, um, that will be a lot clearer. But as we go through this Bible overview, I've got seven E's as we go through. As I say, seven, we're going to go through them quickly. Um, and you can note them down or, or maybe just remember. But the first one is Eden. Now, obviously, when we start any kind of overview, it's good to start right at the beginning. And what we see right at the beginning of our Bibles is that God makes this world. We see Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And this is the place, this place called Eden, where Adam and Eve are, is the place that represents God being with his people. At Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, shows us that God had this relationship with his people. He, he walked in the garden with them. A river flows through the Garden of Eden, which represented God's life-giving presence to the world. And even when we look at books like Ezekiel chapter 28, Eden is referred to in temple language. In short, what that all means is that right at the beginning, God is with his people for good. But what happens is that that doesn't stay the same as the result of the fall of a human decision to reject God's rule. Adam and Eve are banished from that garden. And in one sense, they are removed from the place where God was with his people, that special place. And yet, despite humanity's willful rejection of God's rule, God chooses then one family, one man called Abraham and promises to bless him and ultimately through him bless all the families of the world through him and his descendants. And this, this family that we follow for the rest of the Bible. Eden. Number two, Exodus. Uh, because we follow this story of this one family, and yet this family that God promises to bless, this family that God promises to give a land to, we see that it ends up with them enslaved in Egypt. That's where the next part of the story ends up. They're in Egypt, under, in slavery, under this ruler called Pharaoh. And as you might know, uh, in 
uh, Egypt through many signs and wonders. God rescues his people from slavery through the Red Sea and he brings them to a mountain, uh, the people of Israel to a mountain, Mount Sinai. And on that mountain, God reveals to his people why he brought them out of Egypt, why he rescued them. And it wasn't just so that they would be rescued. It wasn't just so that God would be known as a rescuing God, but rather Exodus chapter 29, verse 46, God says, they will know that I am the Lord their God who brought them out of Egypt so that I might dwell among them. But God didn't just rescue them so they could do whatever they wanted, but rather God brings them out of slavery so that they, he could be with his people, that he could dwell amongst them. And God lays out these instructions for something called a tabernacle to be built. It's like a, a movable tent uh, that would be in the heart of these people of Israel, a big movable tent to be constructed. And it mirrored in many parts the Garden of Eden and how that looked in many different ways. And a curtain was in this temple because the big question that we have at that moment is that how can a God that has shown himself to be so holy dwell with people who are unholy? And that curtain was a symbol of God's presence being restricted, a barrier that remained because of the heart of the sin that remained in the hearts of his people, just like the Garden of Eden. And so God's access in some way is prevented. Exodus. And then we reach our third E, which is empire. And the story continues and we find that God, after many years, God's people find themselves in the land that God had promised to give them. And yet when the people are living in the land, uh, they long for a king to rule over them, just like the other nations. And the king they choose is a guy called Saul. And Saul, he rejects God's word. And what they need, we see, is a king that loves God's word. And then we see, Q King David. And King David is a king who does follow God's word. And under King David, Israel, this people with a let like these, uh, all these tribes become united under one king. And David, one of the major things that we see he tries to do is to have the place of God's symbolic presence amongst his people, which was, as we saw in the tabernacle, this movable tent. David wanted that movable tent to become a permanent building at the heart of God's people, in the heart of God's city, which was in Jerusalem. For the tent tabernacle to become a permanent temple in Jerusalem. And yet in 2 Samuel chapter 7, when David makes this request to God, God in fact says, no, David will not build a house for God, but it's God who's going to build a house for David, a kingdom for David that's never going to end. And that it would be David's son who would be the one to build this house in Jerusalem. And in 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 10 to 11, we see that promise comes true. And under David's son, King Solomon, the temple is built. And we see that the glory of the Lord fills this temple, fills this sanctuary in the heart of God's people. God symbolically at the heart of the people of Israel for God, good. God is with his people. That is what God wants. And yet, well, that brings us to our fourth E, exile. You see, for all the temple building, for all of the symbolism of God permanently with his people in the city of Jerusalem, the place where God had set his name, what comes next after King Solomon? Well, it's a catalogue of kings who failed to live under God's rule. And the nation, this united kingdom, becomes divided in two. Israel to the north, Judah to the south. And progressively over year after year, kings and the people of God walk further and further away from God's word. To the point where we get to one king in particular, King Josiah, 
who we found that they've forgotten word, God's word so much that they have to dust it off after it had been found in this basement somewhere, after many years of never been opened for so long. And finally, after many attempts, at, we see that maybe the, the people of God will turn to God now. Well, they don't. And it gets worse and worse. And the people of God get further and further away from him. And it gets to the point where God acts. God acts in judgment. And God's people are taken off into exile, away from the land, away from Jerusalem, away from the temple, which symbolically uh, was the symbolic place of God with his people. And Ezekiel, a prophet at that time, records a vision that he had. Ezekiel chapter 10 verse 18 says, Then the glory of the Lord departed from over the threshold of the temple. It's devastating. God longs to be with his people. And yet how can God truly be with his people for good when their sin prevents them? And God has to take them away from his presence, off into exile. But even in this dark, miserable point of Israel's history, there's hope. And God promises an amazing restoration to his people. And that's what brings us to our fifth E, which is Emmanuel. Because after 70 years of God's people experiencing judgment from God, 70 years in Babylon, God brings them back into the land, brings them back to Jerusalem. And we see the people they try and rebuild uh, from after the destruction of the city. And that brings us ultimately to the end of the Old Testament. But 400 years later, 400 years later, God's presence is manifested in a totally new and incredible way. And in John chapter one, verse one, we get these incredible words, which says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And then if we look to verse 14 of John chapter one, it says the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father. Literally, John says, verse 14, Jesus tabernacled among us. Jesus made his dwelling place amongst his people by taking on flesh. God comes down in the person of Jesus. God's presence on earth suddenly is in the person of Jesus. He's God on earth. And do you know what the incredible thing is, is that through Jesus, the ultimate question we've seen right away since Genesis chapter 3 how can a holy God be and dwell with his unholy people? Well, it's answered emphatically through Jesus's work on the cross. And we see that all of our sin, all of our guilt, all of our shame, the thing that prevents us from enjoying God's presence, well, it's taken on Jesus. Everything, all of our past, all of the present, all of the future things that we will do and fail God, it's taken on Jesus. And Jesus takes the punishment for our sin. Jesus takes the exile for our sin. Jesus takes the wrath of his father on, our, on the cross in our place and do you know this is incredible look with me as Jesus breathes his last as Jesus breathes his last on the cross we get an amazing statement Re look with me at Matthew chapter 27 verses 50 to 51 it says and when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice he gave up his spirit at that moment the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. That curtain that we saw earlier posed as a symbol of the presence of God being separated in some part. God's holiness is something that God's unholy people cannot just walk into. And yet through Jesus, God has made a way for unholy people to enjoy God's presence without fear of wrath, without fear of condemnation. It is the most beautiful, 
crescendo of what God has done. The curtain torn in two. Emmanuel, Jesus, God's presence on earth. And that brings us to number six, which is, I had to, ecclesia. Ecclesia, now that's um, a a Greek word just for assembly, uh, the Greek word used for church. Now, obviously, um, we live in Catrum, 2,000 years on, and we know that Jesus isn't still walking on earth. Uh, He was the presence of God. He is after his resurrection, he's ascended to the highest place. He's seated on the throne of heaven and he's not dwelling with us physically now. But as Jesus ascended, we get this, um, we get this remarkable account in Acts chapter 2 that as Jesus ascended, the Holy Spirit descends and fills God's people. God's present now, now fills all of his people. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 21 and 22 says these incredible words. It says, in him, in Jesus, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Paul, again, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16, he says, we are the temple of the living God. God is present with his people by his spirit at this moment. Isn't that incredible? God's presence fills you and me as his people, as those who love and trust the Lord Jesus by his spirit. God is with his people for good. Which brings us to the last E, which is eternity, eternity. And this is how the whole Bible ends. Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 to 4. Look with me, I'll read it out for us. It says this, as it's talking about this eternity that's to come. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people And God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. And John carries on in verse 22 of Revelation 21 saying, he says, I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Do you know the incredible thing is the Bible ends by showing us that God will finally be with his people for good. In the place that if you look through that last chapter, bears an incredible resemblance to the Garden of Eden uh, that we saw right at the beginning in Genesis. But the difference is, the difference at the end of the Bible is that in this new creation that God brings, that Christ rules over, nothing will be allowed to spoil it. We will be with Christ, seeing him face to face. Sin, death, evil will be removed forever. God is with his people for good. Now, do you know, we might be thinking this evening, yeah, that's that's great, Dan, but how does that make any difference to me? Well, I hope what we've seen tonight, as we've just quickly gone through the whole Bible, exploring um, God's presence from beginning to end, I hope firstly it shows us the lengths that God has gone to, the time that God has patiently waited so that this evening we could know him, we could love him, and ultimately that we could be with him. That's what I want us to see, that this is the true end of the gospel. The gospel 
is good because we get to be with God forever. And God gets to be with his people. But secondly, I hope this leads us, as I hope that this whole series will, I hope this leads us to not making much of ourselves, but to be making much of God, to see that the gospel ends with us looking to him Christ died not just so that we could be forgiven, not just so that we could have clear consciences before God. He died that he might bring us to himself. That's the big story that the Bible tells right the way through. And you know what? I hope this evening more than anything, I hope that this directs our prayers. It directs our desires this evening, that our hearts overflow with joy tonight of the thought of being with God. And that God becomes glorified in our hearts and our minds this evening. He becomes glorified in our witness that suddenly we get to add this whole new dimension as we speak of Jesus. We speak of us being able to be drawn near to God. That is what he's accomplished. I get to be with God. That is the great cry of the gospel. And so God becomes so glorified. He becomes so glorified as we look to him and we realize this amazing statement that God really is the gospel and that God is the greatest gift that God could ever give to us this evening. Well, I'm gonna pray and speak to this incredible God who has done so much to draw us to himself. Uh, so let's pray as we close tonight. Our Father in heaven, we praise you as the God who has longed since, right the way since Genesis, to be with your people for good. And we praise you, Father, for the lengths, the depths, the heights that you have gone to in order to draw us, people who are unholy, unworthy of receiving your love and your grace, to yourself. We thank you so much for Jesus and we thank you that for the truth that as he died, as he cried his last, that temple curtain was torn in two and it symbolizes a way for your people to enjoy your presence forever. And we pray, Father, that as we go from here, our hearts would long to be with you. Our hearts would long to know you more, to cherish your presence more than anything and to yearn and to long for the day, as we read in Revelation, when we will be with you forever in that glorious and perfect place. And so, Father, do this work in our heart that makes us long for you and your presence more than anything in this world. And may we see it as our highest joy. May we see it as the greatest gift that you could ever give your presence. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.